Hello everyone, I'm uh, Helen Miller, I'm a Deputy Director at the IFS. Welcome to our event on uh, corporation tax. I think corporation tax is an interesting tax because despite the fact that the vast majority of us will have absolutely no direct interaction with corporation tax, it still generates a huge amount of interest. In fact, I think it's probably the tax that is covered most often in, in the news media. And you know, to a large degree, that's because there are big debates going on about whether how we raise corporation tax is fair and whether we should do things uh, differently. So uh, lots of juicy things to discuss in relation to corporation tax. Today, you're gonna to hear a talk that gives you some of the facts and background information you need to know about the tax so that hopefully you can sort of productively engage with these important debates. The format for today is very simple. You'll first hear a talk for around 40 minutes from Isaac Delestra, who's an economist at the IFS. There are then, there'll then be time for your questions. So if you have a question, please do put it into Slido. You can find the link for Slido either where you're watching the video, or if you go to Slido, you can just use the code IFS um, to pop your question in there. And if you like a particular question or want to see the answer, please do vote on the questions you prefer because I'll take the most popular ones uh, first. So that's the plan for today. Without further ado, let me hand over to Isaac to uh, crack on with the talk. Isaac, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, yeah, so as Helen mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking to you today uh, about corporation tax, or is it sometimes known uh, internationally, the corporate income tax. And specifically, um, I'm going to be thinking a bit about the kinds of challenges that policymakers can face when they try and implement these kinds of taxes. So um, just give you like a, a broad roadmap of where we're going to be heading in the lecture. Um, we're going to start off by talking to you a bit about what a corporation tax is on a very basic level, um, and also think a little bit about why we actually might want to have a corporation tax and the kind of purpose that it might uh, serve in terms of a policymaker's toolkit. Um, secondly, we're going to move on to think a bit about um, who bears uh, the burden of corporation tax, who actually ends up ultimately worse off when we impose these kinds of taxes. And specifically, I'm going to be thinking about whether it's shareholders or whether it's workers uh, who, who bear the burden of the tax. And then in the final part of the lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about some of the very specific problems that can arise in trying to impose corporation taxes on multinational companies, so companies based in, in many different countries. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about some of the headlines you might have seen in the press um, about ostensibly very uh, profitable countries that seem uh, profitable companies, sorry, that seem to pay uh, very little tax in some uh, countries. So uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, what is a corporation tax uh, and why do we have one? So um, on a very, very simple level, a corporation tax uh, is a tax on the profits of incorporated businesses. Um, and that's, uh, so most, most businesses that you, you might have heard of, that you might see uh, in the high street or whatever, they're going to pay a uh, corporation tax on their profits. So just to give you a kind of a tangible example, let's say we've got a company here. It's got some revenue flowing in from the sale of its products. It's going to have some costs flowing out. Maybe we have a, a steel widget maker in this instance, and it has to buy the raw steel to make its widgets. Um, another category of costs that are going to be flowing out from uh, the company are going to be the wages of the company, which are going to go to the company's workers. Um, and then pretty straightforwardly, once we've taken away all these costs from revenue, what remains will be our profit. Uh, some of that profit's going to go to the owners of the company in the form of uh, dividends, usually. And then some of those profits might be reinvested um, in the company, maybe to buy more up-to-date widget-making machinery in the future. Now, just a, a side note to, uh, to bear in mind here, it's worth, it's worth understanding that the owners of companies aren't necessarily the super rich, right? Well, they, these aren't necessarily the Jeff Bezoses and uh, the Bill Gates of this world. Anyone that has a private pension in the UK, that private pension is almost certainly invested in stocks and shares. So the class of people who are actually shareholders in the UK is quite a broad class of people. Um, now, back to the corporation tax. Corporation tax, what are we actually taxing? We're taxing this stream of profits uh, that, that, that exists in companies after we've deducted uh, costs from revenue. So that's what we're actually taxing uh, when we talk about corporation tax. Um, now, it's important to note that while here we're talking about uh, where the tax is legally levied, so uh, we're taxing this stream of profits that's going to end up flowing to owners uh, through dividends, it's important to understand that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's owners who are going to be worse off as a result of this tax. As we're going to see later on, 
the ultimate economic implications of the tax um, are potentially quite different. So all I'm giving you here is just the basic legal structure uh, of how the tax is set up. Okay, so that's what a corporation tax basically is. Um, how much money uh, does it raise? Well, uh, in 2020-21, the UK corporation tax raised about £45 billion. Pounds. It's obviously uh, quite a lot of money, but it's worth noting it's quite a lot less than some of the biggest taxes in the UK. So the income tax, for example, raises about four times as much money uh, as the corporation tax does. Okay, so how has the corporation tax changed over time? So on the horizontal axis here, I'm giving you uh, roughly the last 50 years or so. And on the vertical axis, we're going to have uh, the main rate of corporation tax. So uh, the amount of profit uh, that is taken by the government when it imposes this tax. Now, as you can see in the UK, the main rate of corporation tax has fallen quite a lot over the last 50 years. Um, in the mid-70s, it was over 50%. Uh, now it's under 20%. So it's a really, really large fall. And that fall mainly occurred in two big flurries of corporation tax cutting. The first uh, in the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher's government, uh, and the second uh, since around 2010 uh, under the uh, Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition. Um, although it is worth noting that we now have scheduled uh, the first uh, corporation tax rise in the UK in many decades. Uh, which is due to happen in 2023, and that's partially in response to some of the fiscal pressures uh, that have been uh, applied to the UK economy as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, it isn't only in the UK that we've seen uh, big falls in corporation tax rates over this period of time. If we look at the US, we can see a pretty similar trend emerging. Um, and actually, I can show you a whole range of different European countries. I've got Germany here, uh, where we've also seen, seen a similar trend. These secular declines in corporation tax rates are something we're seeing all over the world um, over, the last, uh, over the last few decades. Okay, so uh, we've got an idea of how rates have changed over time. What I want to talk about now is how revenue has changed over time. So again, on the horizontal axis here, we've got a similar period of time. Uh, on the vertical axis this time, though, we're going to have a corporation tax receipts as a percentage of UK GDP. Okay, so two broad things I want you to notice about this chart. The first is just that corporation tax receipts are really pretty noisy. They bounce around all over the place. Um, and the reason for that is that corporation tax is uh, a pretty pro-cyclical tax. So during downturns, uh, when company profits are low, um, you don't get a lot of revenue through a corporation tax. Uh, conversely, in the boom times, when everyone's making a lot of profit in the economy, you get a lot more revenue through these kinds of taxes. So. Um, as I'm putting up here, you can see that the, the, the troughs uh, in revenue from the corporation tax are pretty closely correlated to uh, recessions, stock market busts, uh, that, these kinds of events. Um, the second thing to notice is that while revenue from corporation tax is pretty noisy, while it bounces around quite a lot, we haven't seen any very clear trends in corporation tax revenue, uh, either up or down uh, over this period. And it, it's, so it's worth noting that even though, as I showed you on the previous chart, uh, the rate of corporation tax has been coming down. That isn't necessarily true for the revenue. That's actually stayed quite stable as a percentage of GDP uh, across this period. Okay, so we know basically what a corporation tax is. Uh, I've told you how much money it raises, um, and I've told you how it's sort of evolved over the last 50 years or so. What I want to do now is just take a bit of a step back and, and think about um, why we might actually want to tax profits in the first place. Why, why might we actually have a corporation tax? Well, um, the first thing I just want to impress upon you is that corporation taxes, like all taxes, um, the burden of those taxes is going to ultimately fall on people. Now, that might sound like quite an obvious thing to say, but I think it's quite easy when we think about corporation tax in particular to fall into the trap of imagining that we're taxing some kind of um, anonymous, amorphous entity, and no, nobody is really end up, going to end up paying the cost uh, of this tax. Um, in reality, um, as economists, we don't really care about uh, the welfare of a corporation. Right, A corporation is just a legal entity. We care about the welfare of the people associated with that corporation. And ultimately, some of those people are going to end up worse off as a result of this tax. Either it's going to be the firm's customers, uh, maybe the uh, the the, the suppliers of this firm, maybe it's workers, maybe it's owners. And the reason why this is 
potentially relevant to this question of why we might want to have a, a corporation tax is that it's worth noting that a lot of the streams of income that are flowing out of companies, so in this case, we're seeing wages and uh, profits distributed through dividends, are already subject to the income tax in the UK. So we already tax these streams uh, of income as they flow out of companies. And the question that that raises, the obvious question that raises, is if we're already going to tax these things through the income tax, why do we also want to have a corporation tax? Why, why tax this stream of profits um, twice? Um, now, the boring answer to that question is just that it can be administratively easier to tax companies than people. There are just fewer companies out there than there are individuals. But I think the more interesting and the more fundamental question here is why do we want to specifically tax profits at all? What's, uh, what's the motivation behind trying to uh, tax profits in this way? Um, now, <clears throat> I think one of the key answers to this is that we want to try and tax excess uh, profits. So what do I mean by that? Well, even in a perfectly uh, competitive economy, we'd expect firms to make uh, some profits. Uh, and that's because, let's say I'm an investor and I put my money in a firm. Um, well, first off, I can't use my money while it's invested in a company. Um, and secondly, my money might be at some risk. If the company goes bust, um, I'm going to lose my money. And, and so in order to incentivize me to invest, uh, that company has to pay me a return. The way that companies do that uh, is through making profits. Now, in a perfectly competitive economy, uh, we'd expect companies to make what are known as normal profits. And that's the exact amount of profit that's required in order to compensate investors, uh, firstly, for not being able to use their money while it's invested, and secondly, for any risks uh, they're taking with their money. Now, of course, we don't live in a perfectly competitive economy. We don't live in a, in a microeconomics textbook. Um, and in the real world, there are actually going to be quite a lot of companies that make profits above and beyond uh, these normal profits that are strictly required to make investment worthwhile. And there's a whole range of reasons why that might be. You can think of companies who might have control over scarce resources, so things like oil, diamonds, land, that kind of stuff. Um, or they might have positions of uh, monopolistic or oligopolistic power. Um, now, it turns out that these excess profits um, that some companies may be making in the economy are a really, really good tax base. Why is that? Well, if we think about uh, the reasons that economists often caution uh, against tax, some of, the, some, of the, some of the reasons that tax can have a negative impact on the economy or on economic efficiency, um, is that when we impose a tax, um, it can lead to uh, a behavioural response that can compromise the efficiency of the economy. So if we think of a classic example, if we impose a tax uh, on income, uh, an individual might say, well, I'm not going to work a few extra shifts now because it's no longer worth my while uh, to work those extra shifts if the government's going to take a big chunk of my pay packet. And so we might reduce the amount of work in the economy. Now, the nice thing about excess profits uh, is there are reasons to believe that we won't get too much of a behavioural response by taxing these profits. And so we shouldn't cause too much inefficiency. Um, and the reason for that is that, let's say I'm a, I'm, an, uh, I'm a monopolist making big, fat, excess profits. If the government comes along and it takes away some of those profits, I'm not going to be happy about that, obviously, but I'm probably not going to change my activity. And that's because, by definition, I'm still going to be making profits in excess of the minimum required to make my company a worthwhile investment, um, and so we're probably not going to we're probably not going to see too much uh, too much of a behavioural response to that tax, and that makes it an efficient thing to tax. Um, now, before you walk away with the impression that uh, the corporation tax is this perfect vehicle for, tax, for for taxing excess profits, it is worth mentioning that. The UK corporation tax is currently constituted, and actually this is the case for many corporation taxes around the world, doesn't only target excess profits. It actually targets some normal profits as well. Um, and the result of that can be distortionary. So these normal profits are what are required to compensate investors. So if we tax them away, um, that's going to change people's investment decisions and it's going to change commercial decisions. Uh, it's going to lead to inefficiencies. Um, broadly speaking, though, um, these profits are a potentially desirable tax base, and we can see a reason uh, why we might want to have a corporation tax. And the corporation tax could be uh, a good vehicle 
for targeting uh, this desirable tax base of excess profits. Now, what I'm going to be focusing on over the rest of this lecture um, are the threats that can be posed to the corporation tax as a means of getting at these excess profits when we start thinking about it in an international context. What we're going to see is that once we enter this international context, there are going to be some serious challenges posed to the corporation tax. And that's going to be because uh, we live in a world um, where uh, companies, uh, investors, um, benefit from a large degree of international mobility. And what we're going to see is that that's going to allow them to respond on an international scale to uh, corporation taxes imposed in a given country. So um, that can result in uh, companies or investors uh, moving overseas in order to escape corporation taxes. And it could also lead uh, particularly to multinational companies um, using the international legal system to move their profits abroad, even if they aren't necessarily moving their real economic activity abroad. And we're going to explore both those issues in turn. OK, so the first lens through which we're going to think about uh, this question um, of uh, the way in which the international context can pose a challenge to corporation taxes um, is by thinking about who ultimately uh, bears the burden of a corporation tax um, in an international setting. OK, so we already mentioned that uh, this key point that all tax ultimately is going to be paid by people. But one of the important questions that raises is which people? Um, when we impose a corporation tax, who's ultimately going to end up worse off? Um, and so, you know, as with any tax, when we impose a corporation tax, it's going to lead to a ripple effect across the economy. We're going to move from one equilibrium to another. Um, and in that new equilibrium, some groups are going to be worse, worse off. Now, there's a whole range of potential groups that could be made worse off by imposing a corporation tax. We're going to be focusing particularly uh, on workers uh, and shareholders. That's where a lot of the economic literature has focused on in terms of uh, who's ultimately bearing uh, the burden of corporation tax. And that's going to be relevant for answering a whole range of different questions. So you could think, for instance, about inequality. Um, wage earners, um, on average, do tend to be uh, worse off uh, or have lower incomes than uh, shareholders, even though, as we've already mentioned, we shouldn't think of shareholders as being just the super rich. And so if corporation tax turns out to be a tax that falls mainly uh, on shareholders, it's going to look like a less progressive tax than, uh, than, than if it falls predominantly on, on uh, workers. OK, um, so the way we're going to think about this is we're going we're to have a simple setup. You'll be relieved to hear I'm not going to be doing uh, any algebra in today's lecture, but we're just going to have a, a simple intuitive setup. We're going to think about uh, what effects we might expect to happen when we impose a corporation tax on a small open economy uh, like the UK. So we've got the UK here, we're going to have some standard microeconomic uh, assumptions, and we're going to have um, a few little molecules of production that you can see here in the UK. They're going to be made up of uh, little K's and L's, those stand for capital and labour, as I'm sure you guessed. Um, and at the start of our model, start of our example, uh, there's going to be a prevailing rate of return to capital of 3%. Uh, in the UK. So investors who put their money in companies are getting a 3% return. Okay, so what's going to happen in this economy um, if we impose um, a corporation tax? Well, in the first instance, um, capital is going to be fixed. Um, investment in firms is going to have been spent on machinery and stuff that can't easily be moved uh, around the world. So um, essentially investors are basically going to have to swallow a lower rate of return in the first instance, because companies are now having to pay um, a, a corporation tax and they're having to pay out a return to investors. And so they're not going to be able to afford such a high return uh, to investors. So in the first instance, um, it's the owners of capital, the owners of companies uh, that, that bear the burden uh, of the corporation tax through this lower rate of return. Um, but now let's start thinking about the international Imagine that we have uh, the United States, say another big country, you know, just an example. And let's say the prevailing rate of return to capital in the United States uh, is 3%, just like it was in the UK before we imposed the corporation tax. Well, what's going to happen in this instance? What's going to happen um, is that investors in the UK are going to say, well, why am I settling for this measly 2.5% when I could be earning a 3% return over in the United States? And as a result, 
investors are going to start responding to this tax by moving their investment from the UK uh, to the US. Now, basic supply and demand, as the supply of capital uh, in the UK diminishes, its price is going to go up. And so the, the reduced supply of capital is going to drive the rate of return to capital back up to 3%. And once it reaches 3%, Investors are no longer going to have an incentive to move their money from the UK to the US, um, and we're going to be back in equilibrium. Now, what's happened here, ultimately, if we take stock, what we've seen is that capitalists or the, the, the owners of capital um, are no worse off at the end of this process than they were at the beginning. Uh, right at the beginning, they were earning a 3% return uh, on their capital. Uh, at the end, they're earning a 3% return on the capital. So the owners of companies have basically taken no hit at all as a result of imposing the corporation tax. What about labour? Well, one thing that's changed is there's less capital in the UK than there was to begin with. Investment has moved out of the UK. We could think of this in terms of now companies in the UK don't have as much investment as they had before. Maybe they don't have the most up-to-date machinery anymore, the most up-to-date equipment. And as a result, each hour that a UK worker works, they're not going to be as productive because they're not going to be working with the most up-to-date uh, equipment and machinery. And the result of that, as we know from any core microeconomics course, is that as the marginal productivity of labour falls, uh, so too does the wage. So ultimately, we're going to be in a situation where uh, the owners of capital have taken no hit because they're still making the same returns they were before, but workers have taken a hit because their wages are going to fall as a result of the reduced investment in the UK. Um, and so in this kind of setup, we've basically created a scenario where labour is bearing the entire burden uh, of the corporation tax. Now, in reality, we wouldn't expect to see something quite that extreme in the real world, uh, right? There are lots of reasons, for instance, why capital isn't going to be able to perfectly uh, move internationally quite so easily as that. There might be location-specific location activities uh, that are being invested in. Um, so we, we definitely wouldn't expect to see Labour bear 100% of the burden of this tax. Um, but if we look at the empirical evidence on this question of you know, how much, uh, what portion of the burden of corporation tax is borne by uh, workers, and it's worth noting this is a pretty difficult exercise to do empirically, um, if we look at the empirical evidence, what we find is that there does seem to be a lot of evidence that labour do bear at least some part uh, of the burden of corporation tax. So here's one paper recently that looked at uh, variations in corporation taxes in different US states uh, and used that to estimate that around a third of the burden of corporation tax um, falls uh, on labour in, in that situation. Uh, and another paper that used variations in uh, business taxes in different German states to uh, estimate that around 50% of the burden of corporation tax uh, falls on labour in that instance. Now, it's worth noting that there's no reason these numbers should necessarily be the same. It may be that the burden of corporation tax falls more on labour in some countries than it does in others. Um, and it's also worth noting that there are a broad range of these different estimates in the empirical literature. There's a fair amount of uncertainty as to how much of the uh, burden of the tax is borne by labour, and, and particularly in the UK, we haven't got a huge number of, uh, of estimates of this. Um, but I think it's just worth being aware that you know, when policymakers pull the lever marked corporation tax, there's a fair amount of uncertainty as to who's ultimately going to be made uh, worse off by the tax. And that's as a, resu as a result um, of this high degree uh, of international mobility uh, that we have once we start thinking about uh, corporation tax in the international context. OK, so um, the final part of this lecture, I want to talk a little bit um, about the particular issues that are involved with trying to impose corporation taxes on multinational uh, corporations. So at its heart, the, the problem of trying to impose a corporation tax on a multinational corporation is basically an allocation problem. So imagine we have three different uh, countries here and we've got a multinational corporation that's got operations in all three. Well, this multinational corporation is going to have some total amount of profit that it makes in these three countries. But what these three countries need to decide is what share of that total profit each country is going to get to tax. Now, the way in which uh, the international community 
sort of has, has agreed to do this uh, is through something known as the 1920s Compromise, which was an agreement bro brokered, uh, as the name suggests, right back in the 1920s uh, by the League of Nations, which was the interwar predecessor uh, of the United Nations. Um, and what this agreement sets up is the principle of taxation at source. Um, what does that mean? Well, it essentially means that profits um, are taxed where value added activity takes place, um, not where the, the sales or the customers um, of a firm are located. So let's have a little think about how that works in practice. So um, let's imagine that we have a French car uh, manufacturer, Renault in this case, um, and let's say that uh, the French car manufacturer wants to sell its cars into the UK market, and it wants to do that by selling its cars first to an independent UK car dealership that will then sell them to UK customers. Well, how's this transaction going to work? Pretty simply, the cars are going to be exported from France to the UK, and the UK car dealership is going to pay for them. Now, the value associated with those cars is their wholesale price. That's being transferred from the UK to France, where it can be taxed as part of Renault's uh, French profits. Um, and you can see that taxation at source in this case is kind of working automatically. Uh, the value of those cars is being transferred to the place where production took place. Um, OK, so let's go to a slightly more complicated example. Um, now, let's say that Renault wants to sell its cars in the UK, not through an independent car dealership, um, but through a subsidiary of Renault, through uh, Renault UK. OK, so what's going to happen in this instance? Well, Renault France is going to start off by exporting the cars to the UK, just as it did in the last example. But the difference here is there's now no obvious reason why Renault UK should pay Renault France for these cars, right? We're talking about the same company. We'd just be shuffling around money within Renault. So what the, uh, the legal structures associated with taxation at source mandate is that uh, in instances like this, Renault UK needs to make what's known as a transfer payment to Renault France. And that basically means that it needs to pay for these cars as if these were two separate companies. Um, now, crucially, it has to pay for these cars in accordance with something called the arm's length principle. Now, what is the arm's length principle? The arm's length principle basically means that uh, Renault UK, in this instance, is going to have to pay a fair market price for those cars. So it's going to have to pay the same price that Renault charges to uh, separate companies uh, to make sure that a fair amount of uh, value is transferred from the UK to France for the purposes of corporation tax. OK, so taxation at source seems to be working pretty well in those examples. So why is it that we see headlines like this? Why is it that we see headlines suggesting that ostensibly very profitable companies seem to be paying very little tax in some countries. <clears throat> the key issue here is that as we've moved into uh, a far more uh, globalized economy, there have been some, uh, some aspects of the taxation at source regime that have become less and less suitable to the kind of economy which we live in today. Um, and that's posing some pretty serious threats to the way in which the taxation at source system works. So firstly, taxation at source creates incentives uh, for companies to move their profits to, low tax to, to lower tax countries. So that's pretty obvious. If you're going to tax a company um, on the basis of where it undertakes its value added uh, activity, it's got an incentive to move that value added activity to a lower tax country. Now, in the 1920s, when this agreement was dreamt up, that maybe wasn't too much of a problem. Most uh, big multinational companies were doing things like manufacturing. And it's not that easy to move all your uh, factories and workers from one country to another. Uh, and so it's, it's going to be pretty difficult for firms to uh, shift their activity from one country to another in response to tax. The problem is, um, over time, we've moved to an economy where things like intangible assets, things like brands and patents, have become much, much more important uh, inputs to production. Um, and the thing about intangible assets is it's very easy to move them um, to different parts of the world. And so it's become much, much easier for companies to shift their profits from a high-tax country and to a low-tax country. And we're going to see the kinds of problems that's caused. Secondly, what we're going to see 
is that the system of taxation at source by taxing uh, value added where production is taking place rather than where customers are, can in the modern economy uh, lead to a situation where a company has many customers in the country, but really pays no tax there. And that's gonna be particularly a problem for things like digital companies. Okay, so let's start with the first of these, uh, these two uh, threats to taxation at source. Uh, and I wanna think about uh, it in the context of uh, a cup of Starbucks coffee sold uh, here in the UK. So let's think about um, how taxation at source works in terms of working out where the value of this cup of Starbucks coffee is created. So let's imagine the cup of Starbucks coffee begins life uh, on a Starbucks owned coffee farm in Rwanda. Um, those coffee beans are then exported to a Starbucks owned roasting and preparation facility uh, in Switzerland. What we can imagine here, taxation at source is going to work pretty simply. Um, Starbucks Switzerland is going to make a transfer payment to Starbucks Rwanda. Coffee beans are a readily traded international commodity. It's going to be quite easy to work out what the, uh, what the price paid for those coffee beans should be. Um, next, the coffee beans prepared and roasted in Switzerland are going to be exported to uh, the UK. Uh, and again, we're going to see that Taxation at source should work pretty simply here. The transfer payment from, made from the UK to Switzerland should be quite easy to work out. Uh, roasted coffee beans are presumably sold by a whole number of different companies. And if this was the end of the story, stuff would be pretty simple. Um, we'd work out the total uh, amount of revenue that Starbucks UK makes. We'd deduct costs, including these imported coffee beans. Uh, and then we could work out how much profit should be taxed in the UK. The problem is, we're missing one key component of the value of this cup of Starbucks coffee. And that's the Starbucks brand. Now let's, let's imagine that the Starbucks brand, the intellectual property for that brand is held in the Netherlands. What this means is Starbucks UK has to make a payment to Starbucks Netherlands for the right to use the Starbucks brand. Now I hope what you can see is that knowing the right price that Starbucks UK should pay to Starbucks Netherlands for that brand is gonna be very, very difficult. And the reason for that is that the Starbucks brand isn't like coffee beans. It's not something that's internationally traded on commodity markets. It's never bought and sold outside of Starbucks. And so it's gonna be almost impossible to know what the correct price to pay for that brand should be. And so the truth is that these questions that are very important for working out taxation at source, like where is value created, are going to become increasingly ambiguous uh, in this world where things like intellectual property are a very important input to production. And that's going to make the whole system of taxation at source inherently ambiguous. And I don't think we should be surprised that uh, when we ask companies these kinds of ambiguous questions, they're going to give answers uh, that minimise their tax burdens. So how does that work in practice? Well, Starbucks UK, in our example, is going to have to make a payment for the use of this intellectual property to Starbucks Netherlands. What we can quite clearly see here is that if the UK is a high tax country and the Netherlands is a low tax country, Starbucks has a really big incentive here to value that intellectual property as highly as it can, make as big a payment as possible from the UK to the Netherlands, and so increase its profits in the Netherlands, reduce its profits uh, in the UK, and essentially shift its profits from one country to another uh, through this kind of legal mechanism. And <clears throat> the ease with which uh, profits are being able to, uh, can move from one country to another in this way in certain circumstances, um, has led a lot of people uh, to point to this, this reduction in corporation tax rates that we've seen around the world, which I showed you at the beginning of the, the lecture, and to say that, well, the ease with which corporations can now move their profits around the world is basically leading to a race to the bottom, where countries have big incentives to compete by offering lower and lower corporation tax rates in order to try and attract profits to their country. Okay, so we've talked about this first issue, which is it's becoming easier and easier for companies to move their profits from high tax countries to low tax countries. The second issue I want to talk about, and the second threat that's posed to taxation at source in the modern economy, um, is this question of um, having potentially lots of customers in a country, but paying very little tax there. So 
Um, we can imagine that this is going to be a problem, particularly for digital businesses. So uh, the classic example of this kind of setup might be a company like Amazon. Uh, so Amazon, let's say Amazon sets itself up in Luxembourg, it's going to be able to uh, sell and deliver lots of products to its UK customers. But as long as it doesn't have a big headquarters in the UK, uh, as long as it doesn't uh, undertake any value added production in the UK, it's going to be able to have all its revenues flow from the UK back to Luxembourg to be taxed there. And you can think about a whole range of different digital businesses and how this could be a problem. The Facebooks, the Googles of this world potentially have a lot of users in the country, but don't undertake any value added activity there. Uh, and so won't be subject to corporation tax there. And again, this is a way in which the economy has changed a great deal since the 1920s uh, when this agreement uh, when these these uh, the, these international legal agreements uh, were created, you know, if you wanted to sell products in the UK in 1920, you had to set up uh, a whole load of shops there in a way that Amazon doesn't need to now. Okay, so what kind of international responses have we seen to these problems uh, by by governments around the world? Well, you guys might have seen um, uh, headlines like these over the last few months uh, about uh, this great. Uh, blockbuster agreement that's been uh, signed by different countries around the world uh, to try and tackle um, uh, tax avoidance by uh, international companies. Um, uh, what I want to do just in the very last bit of this lecture is just go over the key elements of this agreement. So um, the agreement is part of something known as the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting uh, Initiative, which for the uh, acronym lovers of you, uh, uh, out there, that's uh, BEPS for short, um, and um, the uh, the base erosion and profit shifting uh, <laughs> initiative has uh, what's known in the jargon as two different pillars. That's basically just two different parts to uh, the agreement. Um, so this new agreement that's been signed, the first the first pillar, the first part of the agreement, um, is basically trying to address this problem of digital companies in particular having lots of customers in a country. Um, but not necessarily paying very much tax there. Um, whereas the second pillar is trying to deal with this issue of companies finding it easier and easier to shift their profits from high tax countries to low tax countries. And it's trying to uh, deal with that by imposing a global minimum tax rate. So let's go through those things uh, one by one. Um, so we've got pillar one, which is uh, addressing uh, this question of uh, tax not necessarily being based on where uh, Customers are found, um, and it's uh, and, and this is particularly an issue when it comes to comes to these kind of digital businesses. The basic idea behind the agreement is to take some chunk of these businesses' uh, profits, these digital businesses' profits, and redistribute them on the basis not of where a value added activity is taking place, but on the basis of where their users uh, or customers are. So Facebook has tons of users in the country. It's going to have to pay uh, some tax in that country, even if it doesn't necessarily uh, have lots of software engineers based there or anything like that. Um, now, that's a broadly sensible thing to do, uh, but it is worth noting that the scope of the agreement uh, is pretty limited. So it's only going to apply to uh, firms with revenues of over £20 billion. Um, details aren't too important. The point is that this is only going to be a uh, it's only going to apply to about 100 companies. So it's not going to apply to very many companies at all. Um, £20 billion is a huge amount of revenue, uh, and it actually excludes lots of very well-known companies that you'll have heard of. These three companies, Twitter, Uber, Netflix, none of those are big enough to, uh, to fall, under, uh, the, uh, fall under the jurisdiction of this agreement. So you know, we probably shouldn't expect this to be a total game changer uh, in terms of uh, how much tax these digital companies are paying. So the second element of the agreement is basically trying to impose a global minimum uh, corporation tax rate. So uh, the basic logic here is that if firms are finding it increasingly easy to move their profits from high tax countries to low tax countries, well, if we have a, a global minimum corporation tax rate so that uh, no countries can offer, let's say, a 0% corporation tax uh, rate anymore, there's going to be less incentive for companies to uh, shift their profits internationally in this way. Um, again, it's a potentially uh, sensible idea, but uh, there are some pretty serious uh, uh, 
you know, there are some pretty serious reservations and it might not be exactly uh, what it says on the tin. And the reason for that is that there are um, some exemptions written into this agreement, which mean that uh, if you've got loads of employees or loads of buildings and loads of assets in the country, you're not going to have to pay this minimum tax rate. Um, and what that means is that we're potentially going to see a whole new set of incentives created for companies to shift their profits to countries uh, where they have lots of employees or lots of buildings, lots of physical assets, um, because that's going to allow them to pay um, uh, potentially a below 15% tax rate. So again, a potentially sensible idea, potentially a good idea, maybe a step in the right direction, but unlikely to uh, be the silver bullet that solves the problems we've seen with taxation at source. Okay, so I just want to come to a, free, a few brief conclusions. Um, I told you right at the beginning uh, of this lecture that excess profits are potentially quite a desirable tax base um, and that the aim of corporation tax should sensibly be to try and tax those, uh, those excess profits. Um, but I hope what you've also taken away from this lecture is that once we start thinking about corporation tax in an international context, particularly, particularly in the kind of international context that we have today, where we have a very, very highly globalized economy, um, there are going to be some very, very um, big challenges that policymakers are going to face when trying to implement corporation taxes. Now, firstly, capital is going to have the opportunity to flee overseas. Um, and as we saw in the middle part of this lecture, uh, the result of that can be that investment in your domestic economy reduces, uh, efficiency goes down, and potentially wages are reduced uh, as a result of your corporation tax. Uh, and secondly, uh, we can see that when we try and tax uh, multinational corporations, um, we can end up in the situation um, where companies are able to shift their profits to lower tax countries, and we end up uh, without any, uh, any international coordination with a situation where countries are essentially competing to offer the lowest possible tax rates uh, to attract the most profits uh, to their country. So that's going to be all from me. Um, I'd uh, be very happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Isaac. So as I said, we've got time for questions now. So if you do have questions, please pop them into Slido and I will uh, ask them for you. Um, so a few questions already. So let's get started with, um, with those. So. Um, Chris McCormack asks, regarding the research that corporate tax burden is broadly shared between workers and owners, uh, does the same happen with uh, tax reductions, i.e. are they shared equally? Um, and perhaps it's an opportunity, Isaac, to say a bit more about um, what we know about the burden and who it's shared between. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I said, the, I think it's worth just caveating um, all the research around the, the, the burden of corporation tax that's borne by workers with the fact that there are a huge range of different estimates in the academic literature as to what that burden might be. And I don't think we can say with a great deal of precision uh, what percentage exactly uh, of corporation tax we'd expect to be borne by workers, particularly um, in the UK where there's relatively limited evidence. Um, uh, theoretically, you might expect it to uh, happen in a symmetrical way if you a reduced corporation tax, although you know you, you do see in other areas that sometimes that symmetry doesn't exist perfectly uh, when you when you're increasing and decreasing taxes. There can be uh, behavioural factors that mean that mean you don't get that perfect symmetry. Um, another thing that's just worth raising is that it's not only workers and shareholders that can bear the burden of the corporation tax, right? So uh, it's totally possible, uh, for instance, under some setups, to imagine that uh, customers might bear the burden uh, of corporation tax through higher prices. Um, or even uh, other companies. So if you're, a, if you're a, a contractor with a company that's having to pay a corporation tax, you might feel a, a knock-on effect as well. So there's a whole range of different, um, different factors of production that can, that, can, uh, that can be impacted by corporation taxes. And we've just been focusing there on, on, on workers, and, uh, uh, workers and shareholders, but, but it can be really quite a complicated picture. Yeah, and perhaps I can add on top of that, that um, the effect won't only depend on what a, an individual country does, but also on how that country's corporate tax system compares to other countries. So if, if a country changes its tax and it goes up or down a little bit, but it really doesn't change how attractive that country is relative to other countries, then the burden may not change very much. But if actually it suddenly cuts its tax and attracts a lot of uh, capital, you know, Isaac showed you the picture of the little atoms moving, or it raises its tax and it loses a lot of capital, 
that'll have a bigger effect on the burden. So there, there isn't really a linear relationship between the, the rate of a country. It's also about how that country fits into the, into the broader landscape. Um, second question then, Isaac. So it's from David Rickard. He, he asks, um, would a sales tax be more effective than a corporation tax? I guess, I mean, I don't know what David has in mind. I think there are two different types of questions that I often get asked about this. So I think maybe you could address both of them. So one is, if you have a corporation tax, would a corporation tax that does it more located on sales, um, so still a tax on profits, but based on the location of sales be better? Or an alternative that the question might mean is, rather than a corporate tax at all, why don't we not tax for profit, but then ta tax sales instead? So as an alternative. Um, so I think there's two different varieties of that question there for you. Sure. So, I mean, you know, uh, uh, as I said, the, the system we currently have is to uh, tax uh, profits where production basically is taking place rather than where customers are. Um, increasingly, as we've basically seen, it's quite easy uh, either to actually or to legally move where it looks like that uh, that production is taking place um, uh, around the world. So there, there, there has been a lot, there have been a lot of economists that have suggested um, that we might be better off um, moving corporation tax to uh, a basis where we basically focus on the share of customers or the share of revenue being made because those things are much less mobile potentially uh, than, uh, than where the production is actually taking place. It's much harder for you to move your customers halfway across the world than it is for you to move uh, your, your production halfway across the world. So it is, it's, a, it's, a broadly sensible, um, it's a broadly sensible way to potentially go with it. Uh, the big problem I would say is that uh, as with any of these uh, proposals to come up with a wholesale with a, the, the new way of uh, a new way of calculating corporation tax is that you're going to need realistically uh, a broad amount of international consensus in order to implement something like that. Um, and the problem with doing that, of course, is that there are always going to be winners and losers when you uh, implement a big change to how corporation tax uh, is calculated. So that you're always going to run up against some degree. Um, of international resistance to uh, to making that kind of change. Uh, great. Uh, so another question from um, JM says, is another reason for corporate taxes not to prevent wealthy individuals from investing their savings via a company to at least defer income tax? And kind of a question about the backstop role of corporation tax in, in taxing personal income. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that, that is also another sense. I mean, that's not something we even managed to get into here, but there are there's definitely uh, a role to be played for corporation tax in terms of uh, ensuring that we tax uh, income that for whatever, you know, through whatever loopholes that exist in, uh, in the domestic tax system aren't being taxed uh, through, any other, uh, through any other tax. And so that's, that's also a very sensible way in which to, to, to look at the corporation tax. Uh, great. So one other, I guess I'll ask my own question um, uh, and abuse my position as chairman. I one thing people <laughs> might have heard about um, if they've been following the press, is that recently we've had these pillar one, pillar two discussions, you know, the big international agreements. But before that, we had lots of countries um, operating their own digital services taxes. In fact, a lot of European countries still have digital services taxes, um, and the Americans don't like that, and they're trying to stop that. Um, so, how does that fit into this landscape, and what should we expect from that going forward? Do you think? Sure. Yeah, so I mean, the way the digital services tax basically works is that it, it's a response to this problem that I was talking about that you can have these big digital companies, the Facebooks, the Googles, the, you know, the Amazons, who have a lot of customers in a country, but don't necessarily pay any tax there because they haven't got any, uh, they're not undertaking any production there. Um, the way in which the UK and, and a number of other European countries responded to this was by basically unilaterally uh, imposing their own digital service taxes on these companies. Basically, the way they did that is they said, okay, we're going to we're gonna do our own calculation to work out how much uh, of that company's global revenue we think is attributable uh, to customers here in the UK or users here in the UK. Um, and we're gonna tax um, their, their, that percentage of their revenue uh, uh, in the UK. And, it, and it's worth noting the digital services tax is a revenue tax in the UK, not a profits tax in the way the, the corporation tax is. Um, now, as Helen just said, the US wasn't terribly happy about uh, the UK and other European countries imposing these digital services taxes because they're because they're taxes on big digital companies, they're effectively taxes on American companies because basically all these digital companies are American companies. Um, and one, one of the reasons why uh, I think the US has a certain amount of motivation to take part in these big international agreements in terms of 
uh, trying to come up with uh, new ways of, of allocating corporation tax is because part of the quid pro quo is that it would like European countries to remove these, these unilateral digital services taxes um, and to move to this more, this more, this more multilateral approach. Great. So um, you mentioned the, the minimum global tax proposal. I mean, how confident are you that that's going to have you know, be a game changer? Should people be expecting that in a couple of years' time we'll no longer be hearing about big multinationals and avoidance, or is that just going to uh, patch up the system? Do you think? Yeah. So I sort of I sort of touched on this while while I was while I was talking about it, but I, I don't think we should expect it to be an absolute game changer. So this is this is definitely a step in the right direction. Having having a minimum corporation tax is not uh, a crazy response to this problem that companies are finding it easier and easier to shift their profits from one country to another. Um, but there are some major issues with the way in which it's currently been constructed. And I think that's largely as a product of the fact that you're dealing with these big international agreements. We have to get lots of countries to, to come to a consensus. Um, one of them is something that I, I kind of raised a bit briefly, but maybe I can go into in a little bit more detail, which is that um, under the current agreement, um, you're going to be able to um, deduct from your uh, taxable uh, profits um, a lot, uh, 5%, in fact, of your total payroll in the country and your total physical assets in the country. And so what that basically means is that if you own loads of buildings in the country or you own loads of physical assets in the country or if you have loads of workers in the country, uh, you're basically not going to have to pay the minimum corporation tax rate. And that's because uh, you know, in these international agreements, lots of countries who have companies employing people in their countries, they don't want those companies to uh, move overseas in response to, ta to tax changes. So they're essentially giving them these, these, uh, these tax breaks for the minimum corporation tax. Um, as I sort of mentioned, you could imagine a world in which uh, that creates a whole new dynamic of profit shifting. You can imagine a world where uh, now companies basically uh, how basically they, they, they can shift all their profits to countries where they have lots of employees or lots of physical assets uh, and benefit from a lower tax rate uh, in that country. So it might not reduce the amount of profit shifting. It might just change where the profits are being shifted to. Um, another thing just to bear in mind is that um, while this is going to uh, reduce potentially the lowest tax rates that a company can access, so maybe it's not going to be able to get a 0% tax rate um, anymore by moving all its profits to some tax haven like you know, Bermuda or something, um, it may still be able to, you know, even if it can access a 15% corporation tax rate, that's going to be lower than most countries have. Um, and it may be the case that even if it's a bit lower than they can get in another country, it's still going to be worth their while. Uh, and if, if for most companies, it's still worthwhile to shift profits, even if it only means they're reducing their corporation tax rate by you know, 5 or 10%, um, then it might be that you just don't see a big reduction in profit shifting because it's still, worth, it's still worth companies' while to shift profits to tax havens, even if those tax havens are having to charge a slightly higher rate of corporation tax. I think you're muted, Helen. School boy error, thank you. Um, <laughs> so question from the audience. Your chart showed that corporation tax rates have been falling since the 1970s, um, but revenues aren't falling. Uh, so does that suggest, and this, is, this is when it comes up in the press very commonly, does that suggest that corporation tax cuts pay for themselves? Sure, yeah. So um, uh, I, I'm afraid it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that. So, uh, I mean, we would expect that, uh, you know, as we reduce corporation tax, as we said, if, we, if we're taxing uh, normal profits to some extent, then corporation taxes are going to lead to some inefficiency. So cutting those taxes uh, might grow the total size of the economy um, uh, a little bit, but it's certainly not going to grow the total size of the economy enough to mean that actual corporation tax revenue increases. You're, we don't live in a world, uh, certainly at the current, current rates of corporation tax, where cutting corporation tax is going to increase revenue. Um, the big reason why we've seen corporation tax rates uh, fall in the UK um, while seeing revenues stay pretty constant um, is that successive governments have basically pursued a strategy um, where they've not only reduced corporation tax rates, but they've also actually broadened the base. Um, and so what, what, what governments have basically done is they've uh, made the deductions you can make from your taxable profits for things like investment less and less generous over time. So that while companies are paying a lower rate of corporation tax, they're actually paying it on a much wider definition of profits. 
Uh, and so obviously if you're paying a lower rate, but on a, a larger amount of money, that doesn't necessarily mean you're paying less tax. And that's the big pattern that's driven the fact that <clears throat> uh, the revenue from corporation tax hasn't fallen, even though the rates have. Oh, great. Uh, it's another question um, uh, from JM. So Scandinavian countries have higher taxes, um, at least overall. Uh, they don't appear to have suffered capital outflows and workers are not paid less than in the UK. What are they doing differently? Of course, these questions are always hard to answer because there's tons of things different countries are doing differently, lots of different moving parts. So sure. perhaps you can give us some indications of the kind of things we should be looking at in comparing countries. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, <clears throat> I haven't actually got the figures uh, in front of me as to what Scandinavian, Scandinavian corporation tax rates are like, but I don't think Scandinavian corporation tax rates are necessarily that high, whereas although Scandinavian tax overall um, is, is pretty high. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that actually corporation tax rates are, are super, super high in, uh, in Scandinavia. Um, another point just to raise, though, of course, is that you know, as, as we mentioned, there are lots of reasons why uh, we're not going to be in this, this world where you whack on corporation tax and instantly all the capital flies out of your country. Uh, there, is, there are going to be lots of instances where uh, companies uh, want to operate in a particular country because they have certain attachments to that country or they can only do what they're doing in that country. There might, you know, there are going to be a whole raft of reasons why, you know, apart from the tax system, that it might be attractive to operate in a particular country. You have to also look at the regulatory environment. Um, you have to look at the, uh, the kinds of other opportunities that are available in that country. It might have a particularly attractive workforce. Um, and so you, you obviously can't just consider these taxes um, uh, in isolation. And you know, there, there's, a whole, there's a whole raft of different um, policy instruments you need to think about when you're trying to consider uh, how you're gonna impact investment uh, in a particular jurisdiction. I should just give you what, give one example of that. Until very recently, the US actually had a pretty high rate of corporation tax. Um, but obviously, it's still home to these big global multinationals. And part of the story there, just to back up, you know, give you an example of what Isaac was saying, is that the Americans have a very generous tax base, so you can deduct lots of costs. And they had a particular, uh, particularly generous treatment of foreign income. So a lot of these multinationals, the income they were earning abroad was sort of treated generously. So often yeah. the headline result, the headline rate, only tells you relatively small part of the story about the kind of broader picture that Isaac's painting about all the other bits and pieces that um, uh, that can that can matter. So we're running up against our, our, our time. So I guess this is the last question. I mean, why don't we step back a little bit? We've gone through tons of details here about corporation tax, how it works, what we're trying to do with it. Obviously, it's an area that's contentious. Lots of debates are happening about what it should do, what it could do, what it is doing. I mean, maybe tell us, you know, give us your views on what's the best case scenario of what we can hope for in, in the coming years and what should we be looking out for? What should people out there be looking out for? And what's going to really change and what should politicians be doing differently or what's the next thing they should be looking for um, in this policy space? Well, I think, you know, I think it is, it's, it's definitely a good sign that, uh, you know, even if these international agreements are flawed, it's a good sign that, you know, countries are around the table and are making tangible agreements on this stuff. It might be that in the first instance, these agreements uh, don't go as far as they need to in terms of uh, reducing the amount of profits that are being shifted around the world. But hopefully, if those agreements uh, are reached and you know it transpires that they haven't done enough to uh, prevent the kind of behavior that they're uh, aiming to prevent, then hopefully at least this will provide a platform and a forum uh, to make more progress in the future. So I think we should be positive that, you know, we're at least moving in the right direction. We seem to be moving in the right direction in a tangible way. There's, you know, these kinds of talks around these issues have been going on for very many years, and we haven't necessarily seen a lot of progress, whereas we do actually now seem to have um, countries coming to a, a tangible agreement. And once you have an agreement, sometimes it can be easier to make pro progress uh, on, off the back of that. So I think there are lots of reasons to think that we're moving in the right direction with this stuff. But I mean, I think you also have to be realistic that we are talking about agreements being made, you know, between many, many different governments, and it's just going to take a bit of time to uh, make the kind of progress that we'd like to see um, as a result, particularly, as I said, because any kind of change you make is inevitably going to have uh, losers as well as winners. As always in tax policy, you have losers, it's hard to do things. But I guess that's a nice place to end, but end optimistically that, you know, countries are around the table, they are doing something about this, so hopefully we have a better system in the in the pipeline. Uh, but let me thank you all for, uh, let me thank Isaac for giving us a great talk. Let me thank you all for uh, listening.
Um, and I hope we'll see you again at another RFS event.